Welcome to episode number 330 of Grid Talk. Today we're here to preview the 2023 Japanese Grand Prix. My name is George Houston, and joining me we have Grid Talk and Monkey, Ke- Monkey Seat co-host Tom Horrocks. Hello. Easy for me to say. Uh, <laughs> Phil Matthew of the Crip Strip Podcast. Hello. And broadcaster Charlie White. Hey everyone, good to be back. But before we get into the episode, we've got to talk about our sponsor for this episode, Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your betting needs. Get the latest odds, lines, matchups, and reports for baseball, boxing, golf, and more. Bet Online continues to be the fastest and easiest way to place your wages, including live betting and your favorite casino and card games available to play right now from your phone. Head to the website or use the mo- or use your mobile device today to sign up and get in on the action. Remember to use the promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, where the game starts. And like I mentioned this weekend, we're heading to Japan, one of my favourite circuits in the world, Suzuka. Uh, and we're going to start with the team that are at the bottom of the championship. I had a much better weekend in Singapore, Alpha Tauri. Understandably, Tom, there's going to be a lot of attention on Yuki Tsunoda heading to this one, as is its, uh, its home race. But the pressure is on from him in the form of Liam Lawson, who got his first points out in Singapore. How do you see them getting on at Suzuka this weekend? Well, I mean, I don't know if we've actually had confirmation yet if, if Lawson's even in the seat for this weekend. That's that's the surprise. I'd like to think he would be after that performance, but not since the days of Brendan Hartley, Daniel Kvyat and Pierre Gasly have we seen such a merry-go-round of drivers in one team. And, uh, oh, look, that's the same team again. So, you know, <laughs> tried and tested. But, I mean, whoever lines up, we know the snow is going to be lying up. That's pretty harsh to drop him for his uh, for his home Grand Prix, obviously. But, uh, but I mean, if it's going to be Lawson... He just needs to consolidate what he's doing, he needs to continue putting in the strong performances. Everything that he does is a bonus for this year. He wasn't expecting this opportunity. So so uh, he knows this track very well. So he's. Um, I, th- I, I expect he will probably be able to put in a good performance if he is in the car. Um, and if it's Daniel Ricciardo, uh, you know, he's, uh, he, um, he's, he's well, uh, well-versed at this track as well. He's raced here a lot of times. Um, my my one concern really is is for Sonoda itself in, in that he was he appeared to be so good at the start of the season he was in a lot of people's top ten including me top ten drivers for the season top five in some cases in the early parts of the season when he was really dragging some results out but now you look at the way other drivers are performing and I see rookie drivers drivers who haven't raced for a while and and although he they've been close to him you know he's not been like he's not been completely destroyed by these people but it just makes me think you know how far off was nick devries and has that given a bit of a false impression of sonoda because he was he was one of my top performers at the start of the year and now i kind of look at those scores that i've given him for the first half of the season and i think are they you know have they got an asterisk against them I, i'm not sure so i really want to see another sample set a few more races with ricardo and a few more races with lawson just to really judge sonoda's season because it's really is from a from a driver who looked like an absolute dead cert for next season and beyond in that team i'm not sure it's so much of a dead cert anymore well that's the thing isn't it it's, it's difficult to judge and the only way to really judge you is against your teammates um sonoda's had three of them this season so it's he's got a decent sample say in that side the only real no quantity though in all of that in a sense was daniel ricardo and he's been out of Formula One, we've only seen him in actually one race, I believe, or maybe two. Um, yeah, it was two, actually. Um, but whether he'll be fit enough for uh, Japan is yet to be seen. And if there's any race that you're going to come back for, Japan's a very tough one. Um, of course, Ricardo's going to want to be in the car, but what are Red Bull slash AlphaTauri going to do? It's the classic problem of too many drivers and not enough seats. Um, we'll see who gets, how they get on with that. Um, next up, we've got Alfa Romeo. Uh, despite quite a few teams... Lower down the order scoring. Alfa Romeo didn't manage to do it in in Singapore. Charlie, not not a great weekend for them. Um, I think uh, I think Tom Downey made me laugh. Actually, Tom Downey compared them to the most boring meal deal possible. If they were a meal deal, uh, that they're just they're just sort of there. And despite Guan Yu Zhou signing on for another year, I don't really see the team picking up too much this weekend. No, I think uh, the whole weekend could be described of what they need to do in very succinctly is do better because it's it won't be hard to do much worse i mean since coming back from the uh, summer break three races and they've only only uh joe and Bottas have completed one race together they've been two dnfs uh since then so they can't even get 
they can't even complete cars or uh, complete a race as a team. <laughs> so it's it's not looking good for the the down you know down the home stretch of of this season. And I don't want to harp on about them because it's it's the same thing every week because they just underperform. But if you look at the the points in the constructors, Haas with twelve, Alpha Romeo with ten, Alpha Tori with five. I really genuinely think that they need to start looking in the rearview mirror for Alpha Tori. They could end up dead last in constructors with uh, with Lawson being on as form as much form as he apparently is. They can give Ricardo enough time to properly heal uh, heal as opposed when you know he had a Lance Stroll situation earlier on. They almost rushed him back. Physio bright uh, things in his wrist, hop back in a car and way he went. Ricardo could actually take the time to heal because they actually have a competent driver that they can throw in. And with that, I really think that Bottas and, and uh, Joe should be looking in their very tiny rear uh, side mirrors because I, I think I think 10th and tenth Constructors is coming. Yeah, their form has um, been poor. I was, I was just figuring out there how many points they've had in the last eight races. There's been one point in the last eight races and that came at... I came at Monza partly because of retirements as well. The the Alfa Romeo is not looking particularly good. We've been saying it all season. They seem to be coasting the way way to get to get get the Audi money, which is apparently already coming in. But in terms of the performance of the car, it's just it's just not there. It's just not showing. And Charlie's quite right to um uh, to highlight Alvatari behind because you know they're not really not really looking like getting many points in front. And to compound the misery, um, Ass actually managed to get a point last time out. At Singapore, Phil, uh, came out getting Hass's first point since Miami. I think it's been about twelve races or something like that. Um, you might argue it should have potentially been more, if, given given Magnussen's qualifying position. But Hass's tire wear is ridiculously bad, and unfortunately for them, I've just looked up the forecast for this weekend in Japan on Sunday. It's meant to be only thirty degrees, so I'm not really expecting too much from them this weekend. <laughs> yeah, I would agree on on that, George. I mean. They can't keep the tires under them, and the just the the amount of uh, G loads and all that stuff that come with all the twists and turns that are that makes Suzuka. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for them to hold up. Uh, I mean, I don't even think that they're going to have their usual uh, Nico Hulkenberg qualify in Q three or get in a Q two kind of deal. I think they're going to struggle in qualifying as well um i mean getting a point first point as you said since miami so that was like in early may that's pretty bleak uh to say the least and uh you know who knows what their what their development if they're developing if they care uh it's just kind of holding on for dear life and you have a lot of races coming up here to end the season and um you know, I, I'm I'm not really sure what to say about Haas other than well, congrats, you were able to get a point yesterday, uh, and uh, it's going to be hard for you to get more, much more after after uh, yesterday's race because I don't see them being able to get past the likes of Alpha Tori or some of these other teams when they're actually functional. Yeah, Haas are not really looking particularly good. They're in eighth in the constructors for now. Um, but it is very tight between those uh, bottom three teams. Um, in seventh place, the, there's a team that's kind of in no man's land. We've studied for a few race, a few races now, and, and that's a very good thing that they will take. Uh, and Alexander Albon actually nearly got a point at Singapore. Eleventh place on a circuit where they were really sh- expecting to struggle. Um, but how do you see them getting on this weekend, Tom? Because obviously the Williams does very well around high speed circuits. Suzuka is a very high speed circuit, but there's also a lot of reliance on the aerodynamics of the car. So is this going to be a tough one for them to score points around? I think it'll be better than Singapore, without a doubt, but it's not going to be amazing for them. I think they'll have a really good sector three, uh, but they'll really be exposed in sector one and sector two. You might find they'll be putting in you know, purple sectors potentially in, in some sec- sections of qualifying in, the, in that sector three, but um, through, through, the, through the S's and around the tight part of the circuit, they are, they're really going to struggle. So um, I, I I think it's going to be better. They might be in there pushing for uh, you know mid, middle of Q two fighting for bottom end points, uh, much like they were in Singapore, but without you know the the Red Bulls and the craziness behind them of uh, uh, you know what was in the end for modern standards quite an attritional race to Singapore Grand Prix. But Williams have shown when the car 
is in that window, they can now fight for Q3 and can now fight for points, even if you've got all 20 drivers on the track, which has not been the case for for a good few years now. And and the, the start of the season, they had uh, one point to finish in the first seven races. And, and since then, they've been scoring an average of once every other race and sent four points finishes in the last in the last eight races. And these aren't just, you know, 10th places. There's some really good points halls in there. Um, but the pressure is going to be on, on the second driver. Logan Sargent is definitely under pressure. We try and not put the pressure on, on the rookies now, but you see what a, a rookie just across the road at AlphaTauri does in, in a couple of races. And, makes you think, well, that's what Logan needs to be doing. Doesn't need to be pulling up trees, but he needs to be putting in performances. And and he got an eleventh place in Silverstone, which is five races ago now. And it's not getting any better. The sharks are circling. And now that Granny Jo has signed for Alpha uh, Alfa Romeo, sorry, the other Alpha team that won't be on the grid next year, then um then there's only one seat left as far as I'm aware. And that seat, you know, they've got people there's gonna be much better candidates screaming for that seat. And just the fact that he's a Williams reserve driver I'm not sure is going to be enough to keep him in that seat but what might save him right now is even if Sargent matched every point that Albon got they'd still be 40 points off Alpine so he's not going to affect their constructors championship but uh but it's they're just out there in their own but um I think they can certainly have room for optimism for this weekend but it certainly won't be a Monza yeah no I think it'd be tough from score points but you never know in the hands of Alexander Albon in particular there's there's always potential there um and I hate I hate to agree with you, but I think you're right about Logan Sargent as well. I think the pressure is going to be on him now. Um, but at the same time, his lack of points has not not really cost Williams. Um, and even if he got a few points, it would get them nowhere near sixth place, which is Alpine, uh, who had a very uh, had a very mixed weekend in Singapore. Uh, Esteban Ocon retiring because of a gearbox failure that I, I felt for him actually with that one. He was on for some good points there. Um, Pierre Gasly did get some good points though, sixth place for him. Um, but Charlie, their their problems the same as Williams in a sense. Uh, McLaren well out in front of them. No way they're going to catch them. No pressure from behind. These remaining races are just kind of probably just just getting them in the getting them in the books, getting miles in the car, and getting some probably trying some new parts for next year. Yeah, when you look at uh, where Alpine is in the standings, they are a middle of the pack team, firmly in the middle of the pack. If you separate the two, you know, above them and below, one half would be over with Canada with me. The other half would be over in Europe. And then somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, all that distance, there's Alpine. Like, there's 58 points between them and McLaren, 60 points between them and Williams. And there's just no way that they're going to go anywhere. Like, unless something incredible happens, and which, I mean, it's why they play the game, but highly unlikely. I really just think that Alpine going forward, because they can put on some good results, like, um, in the, uh, in the, Review of the Singapore race, they were, the panel was discussing on how it could have been a 6 7 for Alpine, and that would have been good double points for them. So they can, they can get up there. I think what they should be focusing on, to use a hockey adage, I'm sure it's another sports too, is but to play spoiler. Because if, you know, if Gasly can steal a podium, which I mean, unlikely, but he's done it in, uh, in the Dutch Grand Prix, ended up third. All these Alpine points could really throw in a wrench to the, uh, close battles that are happening with other driver points. Um, a third place finish and just again, just going out on a limb could really open up the gap between Sir Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso, more than 10 points. And, you know, Alonso is not going to like that, but it's an Aston Martin and we know the Aston Martins are starting to, to decline. They could really mess up on a poor, uh, McLaren or, uh, Russell or, or Leclerc showing, getting between them, that widens that gap too, because those three are in a very tight, comparatively, race in, in the driver's standing. So I, I don't think Alpine, while they're in the middle of everything as a team, have nothing necessarily to play for. They can definitely throw some wrenches in and give other teams headaches, which you can do that and then focus on making sure your car and your, your staff and everything is good for next season because of the, the, uh, the shuffle. I've, I still think Alpine can, I still think they have lots to play for. Yeah, they, they they have potentially a podium in them, like we saw in in Belgium in the sprint race and uh, and the Netherlands as well, for that matter. Um, they have that odd result in them. Um, now, earlier in the season, probably riding the crest of a wave after Silverstone, I did say that McLaren could potentially catch Ferrari, catch Aston Martin. I, I don't think they're going to catch Ferrari. I don't think there's any chance of that now, especially after Carl Sainz last week win uh, last weekend. 
But they do still, in my opinion, have a chance of catching Aston Martin. But, Phil, they need a very good result this weekend. However, I think there's a lot of similarities between Silverstone and Suzuka in terms of them being both really high-speed tracks. You're reliant on the downforce of the car, and a bit of engine power is going to help you as well. So uh, is, a, is, is another podium on the cards for McLaren this weekend, potentially? I mean, I it, I hope for the all the fans here uh, on the grid talk of McLaren that they're able to go and uh, get uh, podiums and top five finishes. I think the greater focus I'm going to have this weekend is not as much about Lando, but what Oscar Piastri can do in qualifying because that's been kind of that the issues that he's had in qualifying have held him back and uh, affected his race day, even though obviously he has the speed. Um, Lando coming off of a podium, wanting to keep that momentum. I think they're definitely wanting to put themselves in a position. Uh, the upgrades that they've brought to the table so far, um, now this is the second stage of upgrades. They've done a really amazing job. And um, the momentum of that podium and... Uh, I think a lot of these tracks suit the McLaren car. So it wouldn't surprise me at all uh, to see one of the McLarens on the podium. I figure that both of the cars should be in Q3 and ha be in the mix, honestly, to compete against uh, the Aston Martins especially, but depending on the circumstances, even the Ferraris and the Mercedes too. I like that, Phil. I like that. You're, uh, you're, you're really pandering to your audience there, like you mentioned. There's quite a few in the Grid Talk chats are uh, our McLaren fans. Um, <laughs> but yeah, let's hope they can get another five-star performance this weekend. And if you think we're deserving of five stars, you can head up to over to Spotify or Apple Music and give us a five-star review on those. We really do appreciate it. We've got a lot of reviews. We've got hundreds of them, but obviously... Any, any more always helps us out with the rankings. And if you're one of the 72% of people who are watching this on YouTube that are not subscribed to our channel yet, you can head over there and subscribe. Uh, ring the bell icon as well so you can get notified whenever we go live. Uh, this one's not one of the shows that goes live. This is a preview. But the qualifying reviews and the race reviews always go out live. Both will be going out at 9 a.m. UK time this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, um, because uh, because the race is quite early. It's in Japan. Um, but yeah, let's move on. To Aston Martin, uh, Tom, an absolutely abysmal weekend, even by the standards of some of the recent weekends. Lance Stroll, very heavy crash in qualifying, sensibly choosing not to take part in the race. Uh, Fernando Alonso was looking like getting some points, but slipped down towards the end. I think I believe it was either a crash or a run, a run, a run wide moment for him. Off the top of my head, the end of that race was crazy in Singapore, so uh, did get a bit lost at times with it, but. How do you think they're going to get on this weekend? Because obviously they're still wanting to hang on to that fourth in the Constructors' Championship, but the pace, especially in the race at times, is just not there in that car. No, I mean, where, where has it all gone wrong? I mean, we were on this podcast at the start of the season saying, will Lance Stroll cost them second place in the Constructors? And there's, no, he won't, he, because they're going to be nowhere near that. But they were talking just, just over the weekend about pushing forward and, and getting back in that fight for P2. It's never going to happen. They've had one podium in seven races. That is not going to be that is not going to be pushing anywhere near going up or they're going to be looking over their shoulder. And like you say, I think McLaren is doable. They need to they need to outscore them by about t 10 to 15 points per race, but they outscored them by 24 this weekend. So, you know, continue to get podiums is possible. But coming off the back of what was, for me, Alonso's worst race performance since he's come back into the sport. And I can't think of a time when he's had as bad a race performance as that. It was, there was the rookie error of just, just, you know, going wide and going over that pit entry. You know it's a difficult pit entry, but Liam Lawson was fine. You know, Joe Guan Yu was fine. Yuki Tsunoda was fine. These drivers that have not been in the sport that long, they're all fine doing that. And then the most experienced man in the sport who's been racing at this circuit since its inception makes that kind of error. Five-second penalty. Loses time in the pits. Has a little spin at the end of the race as well. It, the best part about his race was he had a big battle trying to keep Ocon and Perez behind him. And and it just wasn't a, a great race. And just all these rumours about the the technical directives that have, seem to have affected Aston Martin as well. And, you know, Alonso was very bullshit at the start of the season saying this, you know, this team's only going to get better and, you know, we've got more wind tunnel time. And But they've just gone backwards. It's just not been, the consistency has not been there at all. 
I don't see them moving forwards. I see this as a better circuit for them. But you know, you, you say that that um, Japan is very similar to uh, to Great Britain with regards to circuit design and everything like that. And look how good they were at, at Silverstone. They were absolutely nowhere. I hope for their sake that's not the case because they are going to have to look over their shoulder if McLaren do keep picking up podiums. But it's not great. But you know, even if you look at the Lance Stroll situation, which is you know it's well publicised not just on this podcast but all around about how he's hemorrhaging points for the team. If you theoretically, uh, my 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 uh, lovely theories aren't to run of matching the teams and s- matching your teammates, see how far you go. And but if if Lance Stroll scored a similar points to Alonso, yes, it puts Aston Martin back up in second place, but only by a few points, only by a handful of points. And given the uh, Given the you know the form that Mercedes and Ferrari are in right now, you would still bet your money on them finishing fourth, even if they were second right now. So I, I don't I don't see it as getting much better, to be honest, at the moment. It's just gonna be them looking over their shoulder, holding on, and I don't think it's gonna be a strong weekend for them either. I think they're they're gonna be bottom end points fighting with the Alpines and maybe even the Williams. Yeah, I'm not I'm not seeing uh, much good fortune from them, unfortunately, this weekend. Um Maybe Alonso can pull out a top five or something like that, but by the standards of the guys they're running with, that's not great. They'll be wanting more. Um, but a team that was has gone from a gone from being relatively average by their standards to having two very good weekends in the last few weeks, especially last weekend, is Ferrari, Charlie. Um, now, obviously, Carlos Sainz getting that win at Singapore. I think, like he like he said, he was a very smooth operator. He did a fantastic job. Um, to, to give, give Lando Norris the DRS to help hold off Hamilton in the Hamilton and Russell in the Mercedes, I think that was fantastic team ta- uh, team tactics from guys who aren't teammates anymore. Uh, they showed more teamwork there than they did at Monza, in my opinion. But anyway, we live and learn. Um, but how do you see them getting on this weekend? Because for a long time, it, it kind of seemed like oh, they have no chance of getting second at the Mercedes in the constructors. But it's only twenty four points now. That's not that much. Ferrari could conceivably get second in the constructors championship if they have a strong weekend this weekend. Yeah, and I think the the Singapore race, I'm surprised we didn't see memes or anything pop up of the uh, the Matador with his red cape and a fight in the bull to, to, to victory. Kind of surprised we didn't see that, but I know well, when they got back to the garage, the energy in that would have been, you know, electric. You probably would have felt the, the building shake and they need to carry that forward into this weekend. Will they fight for Red Bull first? Who knows now? Now, Red Bull did have an off week, granted, compared to their normal normal race play, normal race pace, sorry. But Ferrari and Sainz have proven that Red Bull do, they can be beat. They're not invincible. Even when it, like, even without a DNF, they won because they won. And it was, you know, due to some good teamwork. But once, once we've, you know, that genie has been let out of the bottle that Red Bull can be beat. So they threw everything at the kitchen sink in Monza to to do well, and apparently that seems to be you know, that seems to be fl- uh, you know cascading on. And they got their first podium of the year. Signs will go in the history books as the one to stop Verstappen's historic run. Like I, yeah, that's all I can say. It's just they should be incredibly proud of themselves. I mean, even Leclerc with his his tire his tire degradation kind of kind of going off and. He still came in fourth. He was still, I think, 12, 12 seconds or so, maybe more in front of Max in fifth. And uh, and and you know the the usual joke for Ferrari is the pit strategy. They nailed everything the way they needed to do. They absolutely nailed it. And if they can go and analyze that and go, let's do this again. I think, I think everything is is up to. Uh, I think everything's up in the air from now on. Yeah, there's big potential in that car. Sure, I mean a, a first and a fourth. Um... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm with how unlucky as well Charles Leclerc was in the pit stops. It cost him quite a few spots, I think, his stop, just because he was a second driver. Um, but yeah, it's, it's looking good for them, for sure. And they've got a real chance of second place. Um, but Phil, Mercedes, uh, still looking good in terms of pace. Obviously, Russell and uh, Hamilton both chasing down the leaders in the closing stages at Singapore. Russell is going to be absolutely kicking himself for what he's done. And I think we've all, and I always, I always liken the F1, the real F1 drivers to the F1 game. I think we've all done it before where we're just following a guy ahead of us. You get caught in the wheel tracks and you, and you just don't watch where the barriers are. But Russell did that for real, slammed into the barriers, cost his team a lot of points. Um, but are they, are they still the, the second favorites in a sense in terms of the pace? Because obviously, 
on a normal track, they potentially would have got past and got by for the win. I can't. I don't really know, George. I mean, it. Every race, it always seems to be uh, a mystery. Which is this going to be a race where the car works? Is this going to be a race where they're battling to make Q three? Um, one. I mean, Singapore has never generally been a great circuit. Uh, per se for Mercedes and for Lewis. Uh, he struggled in qualifying, but George was able to do well in qualifying. He was in a position, he was basically the one person that was really making signs have to work hard. Um, once the pits, pit stops took place, or once that uh, virtual, the VSC came out and they pitted both the Mercedes to put the new uh, medium tires on, that opened it up, and I i mean, personally, bias aside, I, I felt like Lewis switched on the tires quicker, and it seemed like he was faster, and it really became obvious once they caught Lando Norris and Carlos Sainz. Um, you know, they, they're not going to make that move. They're not going to tell him to move over, but um, I guess George was trying to do whatever he could to try to win the race, but it didn't seem like it because he was more focused on holding Lewis off. Uh, in this case, going in a in a Japan um, consolidation, making sure they're getting the most points they can, um, with some more difficult Grand Prix uh, coming up, a lot more hot races uh, with Qatar and Abu Dhabi and Las Vegas and the like. So, I mean, for for George, uh, lost opportunity to get a podium or possible second place. But he was up there, um, needs to close the deal uh, more often that way. Um, Lewis will probably wonder too, but I, I think for Mercedes, considering where they were a few months ago, to be in the mix and have a chance to win this Grand Prix, I don't think, I think we would have taken, any Mercedes fan would have taken it, considering where they were at at times early this season, so... I mean, it, all to play for uh, going to Suzuka, very difficult circuit. Very, um, It tests every aspect, uh, not only for car, and but driver too. So we'll see what they bring to the table this weekend. Yeah, very challenging circuit. Very good circuit to watch. I love Suzuka. It's um, Put it this way, if it, was, if it was one of the other 10 or so tracks that are not particularly great, I would not wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning to watch it. But because it's Suzuka, I make an exception. <laughs> it's 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 a it's a fantastic track and and you know people can say what they want to say about this season it's, it's not been the most thrilling at times but the battle between Mercedes Ferrari Aston Martin and McLaren at the moment is fascinating and every now and again you'll get a wild Alpine thrown in there as well when they when their car suits the circuit so I, I I really love watching it for that um obviously we had a big upset last weekend where Red Bull didn't even appear on the podium um Max Verstappen was the highest of the two Red Bulls getting fifth. Sergio Perez down in eighth. They tried an alternate strategy after not a great qualifying. Didn't work out for them. Didn't get didn't get any luck with that one. Um, but Tom, are we assuming that normal services resume around this track? Because like I think Toto Wolf said, even when Mercedes were very dominant, they often struggle around Singapore because it's such a unique circuit. Japan is a bit more typical in a sense. Uh, yes, it is. There. I mean, what a slump from Red Bull. They've got to pull themselves out of the slump, haven't they? It's, it's just an absolute <laughs> disaster. I don't know. It's it's yeah. It's huge. No, I they <laughs> they still got a double points finish and were pushing for uh, for a fourth place right on the line. So um, yeah, I I don't think I don't think they're going to have any problems bouncing back. I think Max already bounced back in the race. To be honest, if he'd have started a bit further up, he probably would have been on the podium and fighting in that top four, fighting for the win. To be honest, so um, and Max may have just had that little bit of extra get up and go so I think it was just a bad qualifying performance you know a, a good lap from uh, from Liam Lawson has uh, lost Max Verstappen that you know that winning run so uh, yeah they will be back um, the it's, I'm really looking forward to seeing this because although Christian Horner has come out and said we've changed nothing on the car he was kind of hinting at that that being more towards the wing elements but I, I just got the sneaky feeling they have made changes to the floor because they brought this new floor for the for the technical directive, and then it just didn't work. And but then they all put the off of one that that still didn't work. It obviously they must have changed something on it to to obviously to match the technical directives that that came out. And I just got this feeling that they're not going to be as far ahead as they were. And call it wishful thinking, call it what you want, but 
I just I, uh, probably more out of hope than anything else. I just think they're going to be pegged back a tiny bit. You know, we've seen Aston Martin take a take a bit of a, a slump in form. We've seen other cars moving up in form. We've seen uh, Alfa Romeo bring a completely new car and actually end up going backwards as a result. So it's. It's. I think this is going to shake things up a little bit. This this technical directive, and and although then the teams aren't making much of it, I, I think they uh, they they will be paid back a tiny bit. I mean, Max won last year at Canto. It really is his kind of circuit. It's a driver circuit. It suits the car really well. So I think that they will still be the uh, the, the fastest the fastest car on on the circuit, even if they have had a bit of a you know a bit of a their wings clipped, but. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think we can get too excited about a uh, another new winner uh, this season anyway. So, no, uh, I'm sorry if, if people are tuning in expecting something a bit more positive, but I don't think it's going to I don't think it's going to be that positive, to be honest. Well, we'll have to see. I mean, but you are right. Uh, Red Bull have historically gone extremely well around Japan, not just with Max Verstappen, but also with Sebastian Vettel back in the day. I think he won four in a row or something. Yes, the car was very good back then. He won the championship in all those years, but he was he's always been particularly good around there, probably because of the car as well, which also would have helped. So, yeah, I think this is the track that is really going to suit Red Bull. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. I I mean, I, I expected them, even with that poor qualifying, to be close towards the front, and, and they weren't. So we'll have, to, we'll have to see how they go. But, yes, they have won literally every other race this season. They won 15 in a row. Max himself won 10 in a row. Uh much to my uh, much to my bet's detriment, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, you can go back to some previous episodes and uh, hear about the uh, sombrero bet that I have with uh, that guy over there, Tom. Uh, for the people listening on the audio platforms, he's celebrating currently, and you know what? I don't blame him. I don't blame him because for the longest time, I did say that Perez was going to win in Singapore. He's the king of the streets, and he finished in eighth. <laughs> and so I'm not feeling very confident, but yeah. I'm sure the I'm sure the viewers in particular were very entertained for that when that happens um, because one of us will be wearing it and to be honest with you I think it's going to be me. Uh, but if you want to hear about um, if you want to hear about us on our new social channels, you can head over to uh, at Grid Talk UK and you can stay up to date with the show and all of the uh, all the shows that are coming up. Like I said, nine a.m. on Saturday and Sunday for qualifying in the race respectively. Um, but yes, let's get into the predictions now. Starting with the podium predictions. Um, I, I mean, to be honest, with you, I, I think it is probably going to be Max to win. I think he's going to come back. I think he's going to be. I think he's going to be well ahead. To be honest, um, second, I mean, I've predicted him to get a podium a lot, and he's not quite managed it for one reason or another. I'm I'm going to put Oscar Piastri there. It's got a funny feeling. I, I don't know why. I don't think he's really raced around here much. I could be wrong with that, but I just got a funny feeling. I'm just going to put him in second because the guy's well overdue for a podium now. He he really deserves one. Um. And third, I'll put Charles Leclerc for a better weekend. Um, better weekend in terms of like strategy and look and everything that he had in Singapore. Um, Charlie, what's your what's your podium predictions for this weekend? I think Max will take it, but I think we'll be closer. Like uh, Tom was saying, they'll be knocked down down a little bit. But I think it's still Max's to to lose, despite my. Waxing lyric, uh, waxing lyrically about uh, Ferrari. <laughs> I still think though that they could get a podium, and given the current form of the two of them, I'm going to say it'll be Signs and probably Hamilton battling out for P2, P3. Not sure which one for which, but I think they're going to be the ones to round it out. Okay, okay, Phil, what's your top three prediction? Yeah, we'll go with uh, Verstappen to win, but uh, behind that, I'm going to go with the the besties. Uh, the smooth operator and Lando Norris to finish second and third. Uh, and since they worked so well together this past weekend, I figure they'll also work together this weekend, though it won't matter as much because they'll be 25 seconds behind Max Verstappen. But still, it's still podium. So. I, I do love Carl Lando, and I, I know I've mentioned it before, but like I, I just think it's hilarious how... Signs and Lando Norris show more teamwork than Leclerc and Signs do, and they're in the same team. I just, I just find that baffling. But anyway, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna complain because it really helped out my team last weekend. Uh, Tom, what's your top three predictions? Uh, I, I think clean sweep on Max Verstappen there. Um, more of a, uh, yeah, just expectancy. I think they, it's going to be a, a another win at a counter. To be honest, and Lando Norris for second place, and you know what? Let's give the guy some love. He gets beaten up a lot. I'm going to say Sergio Perez gets a podium in third place. You're so kind. You're kinder than I was. So you know, fair enough. 
I don't like the guy. I just criticize his performances. I like the guy, but he's just not doing well enough. I, I agree. I absolutely agree. He needs to do better for my sake. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to get cold soon in September. It's going to be December by the season's end. It's going to be freezing. I can't I can't do that. I can't do that. Energy bills are expensive. Um, <laughs> bold prediction time. Uh, what are we going to go for for this? You know what? Absol- after an absolutely torrid weekend for his team, it'd just be a very... Very Aston Martin and very Fernando Alonso thing to do very well, but I'm not going to go against my uh, my footing prediction. I'm going to put I'm going to put him in fourth. I'm going to put Alonso for a top four uh, this weekend. Not really based on any facts or evidence or anything. Charlie, what's your what's your bold prediction? My bold prediction is going to be hearkening back to my ideas with Alpine. They're going to play some real spoiler for somebody. They're going to make somebody's day miserable steal a podium, do something like that. Just come out of nowhere and just go, ha ha, sucker. And that's it. (sighs) Very bold indeed. Phil? I was going to do something with Alpine, but uh, Charlie came through with that. So I'm going to go and change it. And I'm going to go with Yuki Sonoda finishes in the top six. Oh, the home hero himself out of nowhere. Tom, can you beat that? Well, I was going to say Yuki's no the best finish of the season, so P9 or higher, but that doesn't seem so bold now I've seen Phil. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to do what Phil said he was going to do, but it, but he's obviously abandoned his principles. I'm going to go for Logan Sargent gets points. <laughs> Somebody has I'm, to stop saying that. <laughs> I I had to do that this week. I couldn't. It's after he crashed <laughs> yesterday by himself. I I just. The, the now that all now the all the bugs are getting to him and stuff because he's like raw meat. I mean, it's I'm starting to get really really concerned about his you whereabouts. Him. Now now that I'm back in him, you watch him get the points. <laughs> I think that's what happened for George Russell for me back in the day. There was one weekend when I wasn't on the shows and he got his yeah. and he got his first points after I predicted it for like a year and a half. Oh man! So uh, yeah, if you want to if you want to hear more from um, from our panelists. Uh, it's time to time to plug the outlets. So, uh, Charlie, I mentioned that you're a broadcaster. Where can we uh, see and hear more from you? Yeah, I say I'm with Eastlink Community TV, and we're on the maritime provinces of Canada. And just kind of plug ourselves a little bit. This uh, this coming Friday, we start our brand new season of Friday Night Hockey, and it's going to be uh, if you're a listener from our area, uh, it's going to be a special one because we're covering the jersey raising and retirement of Nathan McKinnon, who was very important into uh, Halifax's run on winning the uh, winning the QM Quebec Major Junior Hockey League's uh, first the, it was their first uh, uh, franchise win for the whole the whole deal so we're going to be covering all that that starts at 6:30 and the game the opening game starts at 7 Phil I mentioned that you're a part of the Grip Strip podcast why is that and where can people find it I just have to go and uh, mention with Charlie's uh bit there talking about Nathan McKinnon as a Colorado Avalanche fan. I'm very happy to see that he's getting his props going back to his earlier days before he became the uh, vice captain for the Colorado Avalanche. But the Grip Strip podcast is uh, around. You can go and listen to it myself and Josh, a fine a former guest on this show. Uh, we talk about all things uh, motorsports, uh, oh, not only uh, domestically, but world in the world, four wheels, two wheels, as long as it goes fast, we talk about it on the Gripster podcast. We'll be on this week for episode 187. So, uh, talking about all the stuff that went on at Bristol, at Singapore, et cetera, et cetera. Now there's even more news with IndyCar. And uh, Indy is actually going to have a race for the first time in a decade. So, with MotoGP. So, we'll talk about all that um, this week. Um, and, Thanks as always for having me on. Great to be on with everyone here and um, look forward to contributing more as the season goes on. Yeah, always great to have you on, Phil. And closing in on 200 episodes as well for a grip strip as well. Well done on that. That's fantastic going between you and uh, you and Josh on that one. Um, Tom, I mentioned that you're, uh, you're a, grid, a Grid Talk co-host, but you're also a host on Monkey Seat Podcast as well with the evergreen Carl King, which I believe you caught an episode earlier today for. We did, yeah. Well, uh, probably a bit later by the time this goes out, but uh, yeah, we recorded it Monday Monday afternoon. Uh, so we're at Monkey Seed Pod on the socials and uh, come and uh, come and give us a listen. It's the Grid Talk's dirty cousin, 
uh, where we just say a lot of things that we uh, probably shouldn't do, but uh, we, we have good fun doing it anyway. Yeah, it's it's very much grid talk uh, after dark, uh, which it's actually quite dark in here at the moment now. Uh, <laughs> the the nights are closing in, and but to help, if you want to help with that though, you can buy you can go and donate to our uh, Patreon where you can get some where you can donate and give us some lot better lights, might better recording equipment as always. Uh, and Grid Talk is also available on YouTube, where most of the episodes are recorded live. Not this one, unfortunately. It's a preview, but the qualifying reviews and the race reviews are. Uh, and you can also find us on Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal, and Pocket Cast. Just search for F1 Grid Talk. It's been our big back catalogue of shows, over 300 episodes, closing in on 400. Uh, and yeah, and if you want to head over there, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well to be the be first to know when those new episodes are going out. And yeah, I want to thank my panelists for coming on tonight. I really do appreciate it as always. You're very welcome. Great to be here. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, we'll be back on Saturday morning to react to qualifying for the Japanese Grand Prix. Thank you very much for joining us and goodbye. <laughs>